Alright. Okay. Are we good? Alright. So, no, I'm not. I'm going to in a bit because I want to I want to move on through this. So we left off with the Pierce presidency, and I and well, the one uh, significant accomplishment that was was done during the Franklin Pierce presidency was the Gadsden Purchase. The Gadsden Purchase is not just a land purchase for railroad development, which we are obviously can see that they want to be able to build a railroad that will connect uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, well not yet Arizona, it's all Arizona's part of the New Mexico territory, and California, but what we might not, well maybe you remember from prior knowledge, is that the goal of the Gadsden Purchase was to buy much of northern Mexico, and what might what do you think might have been a major argument over buying such a large section of northern Mexico that was never, it was never purchased? They never got, they just got what is on the map here. What might be a major issue of basically buying just everything north of Mexico City all the way to the border of the Arizona, New Mexico, and Taxes. Well, it's a territorial issue, but I want a specifically American issue. Specifically, an American issue. Maybe like the Mexican area. That's the the Mexican government's worried about that. Who said slaves? Good job, Graham. Slavery is the issue. The South and the North are clamoring to figure out if this Gadsden purchase is large enough, will it be another debate over potentially new slave territory? And there were politicians at this time, Southern Democrats and Southern Whigs, who we called the, the um, Cotton Whigs, that wanted to see this land purchase go down so possibly slavery could spread in northern Mexico. Okay, I added a note for you here I wanted to just bring up in relation to the um, Fillmore and, um, and Pierce presidencies. The Christiana Revolt was an important revolt that occurred as a result of the Fugitive Slave Act. And I want to I want to also add, Andrew asked a really great question last class, and I felt like I kind of, I answered it, and I moved on, and, and I was just, it sort of hit me when I was, doing something between the last time I saw you. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, Andrew asked, you know, how in the world could so many people be sent out to catch fugitive slaves when police forces were not as large? And I said, well, yeah, there were actually hired bounty hunters and there were federal marshals and like, oh yeah. Well, the other thing that I wanted to add too is that if a federal marshal didn't have time, he could go into a community and deputize whoever he wanted. So by deputizing people to be slave catchers, it created a really, really horrible political scenario because all these people who would have not been, not had any opportunity to have any law enforcement, um, any power in law enforcement now have had power because they were deputized by federal marshals to follow the Fugitive Slave Act. Yeah. Isn't that kind of an abuse of power just to like walk up in there and be like, you, in the blue. But that's the thing. You're a deputy now. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the, irony in, the irony of all this is that it is a federal law. So it's, it's ironic that it is not only an abuse of power, but it's also ironic because the southern states, they hated federal law. They were all about states' rights. They were all about their local rights. So this is a federal law that they could not only get behind, but it also became an abuse of power in a lot of communities where people got deputized that did not have, had no business having any law, power in law enforcement. Um, all right, so the Christiana Revolt, has anybody ever heard of the Christiana Revolt? 
Does anybody know where Christiana, Pennsylvania is? It's uh, it's in between Lancaster and Westchester, PA. Um, you know, Amish country. Um, well, Lancaster being Amish country. Um, this particular uh, slave owner from Maryland, Gorsuch, was going up to find a, a one of his um, runaway slaves. He tracks with a group of uh, a group of bounty hunters or slave catchers, tracks them down to a group of free African Americans and Quakers in Christiana who were part of the Underground Railroad, and a shootout ensues. Well, it becomes sensationalized, and it becomes one more dividing force between North and South. The South is saying, you know, this is, the, or not just the South, but a lot of slave holding states are saying, this is, this deserves federal action. Federal troops should be brought in to, to squash this rebellion, but this rebellion, it wasn't a rebellion. It was a revolt that involved less than 20 people. Um, whereas the North said, this is one more reason why the Fugitive Slave Act is one that is, is um, a abuse of power. And then over on the, um, on the right there, I wanted to talk a little bit about the o uh, Ostin Manifesto. Um, this is a meeting that occurred in Belgium um, between foreign diplomats. The American diplomats that were present were was uh, Pierre Soleil, whose image is here on the top right. He's a Louisiana-born planner who was minister to Spain and foreign minister to France at the time, James Buchanan. And the idea was a plan to basically buy Cuba, and that if Cuba would not, or if Spain would not sell Cuba, that we would go to war with Spain. Um, but that goes back to what Graham just brought up a, a, a few minutes ago. The North and the South are divided on, okay, if we bring in Cuba, what does Cuba become? Does it become a state? And if it becomes a state, does it become a slave state? Not to mention, what had already existed in Cuba? Okay, you have totalitarian leadership and you have large numbers of slaves, right? So are you going to re-enslave these people in Cuba? That is real, that, there are southern politicians that want that to happen. And there are northern politicians that don't want to see Cuba come in. And this whole thing, it, it stalls. The, the um, Taylor, Fillmore, and Pierce administration are gonna balk on um, trying to purchase Cuba in the Ostin Manifesto, but do keep in mind that it was another dividing force in the American Civil War. All right, let's move on to a major dividing force and really one of the earliest uh, groups of skirmishes and battles leading up to the American Civil War, and that would be the Kansas Nebraska Act and believe Kansas. Did we get this far yet? Did anybody have any questions about uh, the, the Christiana revolt or the Ostin? Okay. Um, and that price tag on Cuba, they were looking to purchase it for $130 million. Um, obviously, that didn't work out. Um, okay, so Stephen Douglas, uh, Compromise of 1850 guy that had worked with Henry Clay, decides that popular sovereignty needs, needs to spread. You remember who, who was the American politician that got the popular sovereignty idea rolling? He had run against, it's not, it's not Pierce. He actually ran against Zachary Taylor. He's a Michigan politician. His name was Lewis Cass, C-A-S-S, -S, Lewis Cass. So Lewis Cass had come up with this popular sovereignty idea, and a lot of Democrats took off with it, and one in particular was Stephen Douglas, who, as we've already discussed, the Democratic Party was beginning to drift apart. There was a bit of splintering going on there, and Douglas thought the popular sovereignty would bring the party back together, and he had some motives here for the Kansas-Nebraska Act. 
wanted to see the Kansas and Nebraska territory settled. And if you were thinking in your mind, if you're just thinking about the state of Kansas and the state of Nebraska, it was far more territory than that. It was basically Kansas out into Colorado and Nebraska all the way up through the Dakotas. So it was a big piece of land. What do we already know? What, what tribe dominates that territory? Mostly. The Sioux, very good. So we already know that tri there, there are a large number of tribes that dominate that area of the Plains region. So Douglas wants to see folks going out that way because there is a financial um, gain for the state of Illinois, which is he, he's the senator from the state of Illinois, and that financial gain will be the building of a transcontinental railroad. As we already know, California, a stipulation for California coming in as a free state in the Compromise of 1850 was that a railroad would be built connecting east to west. And Pierce had already proposed a transcontinental railroad. That was part of his campaign when he ran um, in, in, the elect, in, in the election that we just discussed, um, 1852, which was what we talked about last lesson. So Douglas is going to push for the Kansas and Nebraska territory to be settled in a lot of popular sovereignty. But that does away with the Missouri Compromise. Because if we remember the Missouri line, all that territory north of Missouri was free territory and south of Missouri was going to be slave territory. So this is going to create a situation that no one really anticipated. It also creates a new party movement. The Kansas-Nebraska Act and the Bleeding Kansas, events of Bleeding Kansas, lead to a meeting at Ripon, Wisconsin in 1854 that is the formation of the Republican Party. And we're going to talk about what that meeting entails and all the groups that kind of come in to the Republican Party um, here in a bit. So here we got the little giant, Stephen Douglas. That is all of the Kansas Nebraska territory in blue. And then we got the Missouri Compromise line from 1820. So people flood into Kansas on the border of Missouri and Kansas to determine whether the state is going to be free or slave. The pro-slavery people were known as border ruffians, and the free soilers were known as jayhawkers. They come armed, ready to fight. The first armed conflict is going to be near Lawrence. Most of all of the battles are fought in and around Lawrence, Kansas, and just outside of Kansas City, which sits on the border of, of Kansas and Missouri. So the first major battle and the first free soil martyr that is killed is the Wakarusa War, which was near Lawrence. And people are going to go to the ballot box, and the election will be rigged by the pro-slavery, um, by the pro-slavery folks. And when they go to the ballot, ballot box, they're going with they're going with pistols, they're going with muskets, they're going with knives, they're going with swords. There are 10 major skirmishes or battles that are fought over the course of not just the early year of Bleeding Kansas, but from 1856 all the way to the start of the Civil War. So if you, that's why a lot of historians, especially folks from the Midwest, Kansas and Missouri, or as one of my buddies from grad school, uh, Missouri, Mike is from Missouri. Um, they would say that the Civil War began there because the fighting from uh, the Battle of, or war, walk, it's the Wakarusa War, is what they called it, through Pottawatomie Creek, through the Sack of Lawrence, all the way up to the Civil War, fighting continued on the border of Kansas and Missouri. In fact, we could look at the border wars, where, and we'll, we will look at the border wars. The border wars on in Kansas and Missouri, in Virginia and West Virginia, they were like wars within the war that were going on throughout the American Civil War. Um, the sack of Lawrence was a pretty brutal, uh, brutal attack. Um, Fifty-six people were killed 
in these battles. Um, the most people were killed in the in the um, attack on Lawrence, and there were mostly civilian casualties. Not to mention businesses and homes and farms were destroyed. Um, hundreds were wounded in these battles. John Brown obviously launched one of the more famous skirmishes. You remember skirmishes, a small battle. He, he and his sons, their attack on uh, Pottawatomie Creek that killed five pro-slavery border ruffians. And as I said before, following Wakarusa, there's like nine major skirmishes. So about 10 major battles altogether. Kansas will ultimately become a free state in 1861, but the fighting continues. Any questions about Bleeding Kansas? All right. So in response to the, bleeding, to the events of Bleeding Kansas, Free Soil Senator from Massachusetts, who will ultimately become a radical Republican, Charles Sumner, will give a speech on the Senate floor called the Crimes Against Kansas, where he talks about the horrible events that are taking place and the fact that the spread of slavery is the root of all of this evil. In his speech in the Crimes Against, uh, against Kansas, he calls out South Carolina Senator Andrew Butler who was not only a staunch defender of slavery, but was a slave owner himself, and a supporter and defender of the border ruffians, the pro-slavery folks that had spilled into Kansas um, to fight the Jayhawkers. Butler was not present to defend himself, but his distant cousin, <coughs> Preston Brooks, was. Brooks will make his way down to the Senate floor, and he will beat Charles Sumner within an inch of his life on the Senate floor. Following this, these events, people start to walk into the Senate and into the House chambers armed. Furthermore, uh, it takes Sumner months to recover from the beating. And in response to the beating in the South, Butler's constituents and other Southerners sent him canes in celebration of the beating. So this whole, these series of events in Kansas and the Brooks and Sumner events are going to be polarized in the election of 1856 and that in that particular election James Buchanan will easily defeat Republican candidate John C. Fremont who I believe Sam you did your your research on correct yeah. um, the uh, pathfinder and the, and the leader of the Bear Flag Republic. This is the image of Sumner being beaten by Brooks. Southern chivalry argument versus clubs. All right, so let's just take a look at the election of 1856. A little bit about James Buchanan, the Democratic candidate. He is a northerner. So he is a um, Pennsylvanian that will, will want to keep slavery um, off the, out of the uh, conversation in the election. He is not interested in abolishing slavery. So the Democrats feel like they got a bit of a victory here because they got a guy who has political experience, has foreign policy experience, and they're going to do what they've done before. They are going to run a Southerner with him. The Southerner that they choose is Kentuckian, um, uh, Kentucky um, later or military leader. And he'll ultimately be a gener general, John C. Breckinridge, and he will run um, as a Southern Democrat in the election of 1860. We'll talk more about Breckinridge as we move into into the courts. Um, he'd been minister to France. He'd been president of the uh, Ostend Manifesto. He supported the Fugitive Slave Act. He did not want the federal government to interfere with slavery. 
and he supported the Transcontinental Railroad proposed by Pierce. Fremont, leader of the Bear Flag Republic, um, supported free soil, therefore he had abolitionist leanings, and he supported a high tariff. The second bullet there is what cost him the election. The fact that he was a free soiler, he was not going to get, he wasn't going to get enough southern and northern support to win this election. And remember, the Democratic Party, though splintered, has not officially divided yet. They will do so in the next election over the issue of popular sovereignty. Millard Fillmore, remember him? He's your president that became president after the death of Zachary Taylor. He is a know nothing candidate. Remember, most of our know nothings are out of major city centers. Most know nothings were New York City. There are also some know nothings in Boston, Philadelphia. They were the nativist party. They were anti immigrant, anti Catholic, anti Irish. So we see Breckenridge will win uh, handily in the Electoral College. It'll be a bit closer in the popular vote. And then Miller Fillmore um, does a little bit better than, um, than Van Buren had done as a free soil candidate. He does manage to secure some electoral votes. Um, so a little bit about uh, these vice president, presidential candidates. So Buchanan's candidate is John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Fremont's candidate is going to be William Dayton of New Jersey, and then Millard Fillmore's running mate, Andrew Jackson Donaldson. Any idea who that guy is? Not son of, but nephew. nephew. Very good. Nephew of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson Donaldson. Well, yeah, they're naming, naming, naming him in honor of, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so this just gives you a map of the breakdown. You can see that Buchanan is going to carry the South and the West. Fremont will carry the New England, and not the majority, but about half of what we would call the Northwest Ordinance states, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And then this just shows you by county who carried what. And you're probably wondering, like, why do you care, Mr. E, about showing us three maps related to the election of 1856? The reason that I am showing you this is that I want you to see that though the Democrats won this election in 1856, you can see that the North in both of these maps, they are getting behind this new party. They are significantly behind the Republican Party. And what the Republican Party had done in that meeting in Wisconsin is they brought together the Free Soilers, they brought together the Conscious Whigs, they brought together the third party splinters that were not Democrat, like the anti-Freemason and some of those other parties. They're gonna bring those parties together under one umbrella. And that's gonna be significant and, and, and you can see that coming together in the election of 1856. And there we have James Buchanan. All right, one issue that Buchanan is going to have is that he really does nothing in relation to the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott decision is one more cause that is going to lead to the American Civil War and more division between North and South. Dred Scott was a slave born in South Hampton County. He was sold into slavery in Missouri. His owner was a doctor who had spent some time in free Illinois and Wisconsin territory and moved back to Missouri. After his owner had died, he decided that he and his wife would try to gain their freedom because they had lived in free territory. So he will appeal to the courts. He will get a group of lawyers to sue for, help him sue for his freedom. In this case, will um, ultimately end up in not only the state court, but will wind up in the Supreme Court. Kind of an interesting little uh, sort of caveat about this. Scott B. Sanford, Sanford is his, was his new owner, that 
his, his name's not spelled correctly. It was a typo by the Supreme Court. And they spelled the name wrong and it just stuck. So um, in Scott v. Sanford, what happens here is that the Chief Justice is Roger B. Taney. Roger B. Taney, not only a Maryland slaveholder, but also nominated by Andrew Jackson. He declares that no slave or descendant of a slave was a U.S. citizen, nor would be a U.S. citizen. Therefore, they had no right in court to sue because they had no citizenship. They were property, not citizens. All right? It was decided on March 6, 1857. Scott was not a U.S. citizen. Therefore, he couldn't sue. Residence in a free territory did not make him free. And Congress couldn't ban slavery in any territory anyway. So what these three notes at the bottom are going to do is they're going to basically determine that the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional and it's going to violate the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution which prohibited Congress from depriving people of their property rights through due process of the law. This strengthens the power of slaveholders and it strengthens the the um, issue of slave ownership, not to mention, what does this do for free African Americans? Yeah, their rights are ripped away because now they are going to be brought into, their citizenship is going to be brought into question, correct? Michelle, what were you going to ask? How was it originally? Oh, the, um, uh, they left out the, I'm trying to think that they, Leave out the D, Scott B. Sanford. They either, so S A N F O R F O R D. It should be S A N D F O R D. Sanford, Sanford. Yeah. Um, Pro slavery forces loved it. Legalized slave ownership nationwide. Anti slavery forces in the North were horrified. Again, this is a victory for the South. It caused public protest, a deeper division with the, between the nation. And this is a really sad thing. Dred Scott ultimately did get his freedom, but it was only for a short time. He died of tuberculosis in 1858. How did he get his freedom? No, he didn't. Yeah, they actually, after the case, um, they ended up freeing him. Family freedom, yeah. All right, Lincoln-Douglas debates. Did you guys have any Fred Scott questions? We good? All right, Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. Douglas is the Democratic candidate. He's obviously got a pretty big reputation in the Senate, um, but his reputation has been marred by the events of Bleeding Kansas and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He is clinging tight to his popular sovereignty resolve. Former Whig, now Republican, Abraham Lincoln is going to run as the Republican candidate, and they are going to go on a stump speech tour throughout Illinois, which if you go in and around Illinois, you can go to the locations where they've created statues for like the little, like there's statues of them debating um, throughout Illinois. The, um, Senate race in 1858. Douglas, as I said before, he is saying that popular sovereignty should be allowed in the West, and he is fighting for that cause. Lincoln, as a Republican, is saying slavery should not spread West. House divided cannot stand. The country could not remain half slave, half free. Do not be fooled. Lincoln is not an abolitionist. He does not want to end slavery in the South. In fact, his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, is from a slave holding family in Kentucky. Lincoln never owned slaves. It's just that he's not an outright abolitionist in this election, nor is he an outright abolitionist in the presidential election of 1860. He loses the Senate race and does not gain the Senate seat but what does he get out of it? He gained name recognition and party support for the new Republican Party. 
forced Douglas to admit that he did not agree with the Dred Scott decision as a result of his popular sovereignty um, resolve. He helped intensify the divide in the Democratic Party and he, came, and he gave the Republican Party a new national leader. Whoops. So here we have the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Any questions about the Lincoln-Douglas debates? These stump speeches throughout Illinois. All right, another major event that we've already covered, so I'm just going to briefly go through this. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. We know why Harper's Ferry is important. You guys did a really good job of that discussion before. It lie on the, it's an arsenal that lie on the fork of the, of the um, Potomac and the Susquehanna, or sorry, Potomac and the Shenandoah. Susquehanna is in, flows through Harrisburg, PA. We'll talk about the Susquehanna later. So it's, it flowed, uh, the fort was, or arsenal rather, was um, on the fork of the Shenandoah and the Potomac. It's in present day West Virginia, then Virginia, basically where West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia come, converge. Um, Brown decided that he and a group of slaves would raid the arsenal, take up arms, get weapons to slaves, and they would lead a bloody revolution throughout the South. Problem was, not enough people joined, um, and by the time they raided the arsenal, sadly the first person they killed raiding the arsenal was a free African American, and they are going to get trapped inside the firehouse at the arsenal, holding hostages. Colonel Robert E. Lee and a detachment of U.S. Marines and Major James Yule Brown Stewart, Jeb Stewart, will go by train from D.C. to Harper's Ferry to put down the rebellion. They will successfully put down the rebellion. Brown will be tried and will be executed in Charlestown, West Virginia, or then Virginia, now West Virginia, Charlestown, and he becomes a martyr for the abolitionist cause, and as Herman Melville called him, the meteor of the war. Keep in mind, this leads to the southern militias, state militias, beefing up their armor, okay, where do you think they're going to start purchasing weapons from? Well, not illegal at this time, totally legal. Some of them are going to be purchased from the north, but a lot of them are going to be purchased abroad. What would be a place where they might want to purchase weapons? Nope, that's a good guess though. Yes, England and France, okay? So we're going to talk about some early English weapons that the Southerners used. We're going to talk about the Enfield. That was a, a musket that was used and that was built in the 1850s that you'll see a lot of early Confederates using before Richmond makes the, a replica of the Springfield. Here we have John Brown. John Brown approaching the gallows. We already took a look at that painting. So all of these events, any questions about Harper's Ferry? I feel like we, we covered that pretty, we went pretty in depth with that um, in here prior to the lesson. All right, so the rise of the Republican Party in 1854 was a result of anti-Kansas-Nebraska parties, very much, coalition of free soilers, anti-slavery Whigs, also known as the Conscious Whigs, anti-Democrats, because of Splinter Party movements, and Northeast Nativists, the Know-Nothings. The Republicans became a party of reformists, anti-slavery Protestantism, um, Northern Protestant movements, capitalism, and modernization. So that takes us to the, pre the presidential election of 1860. 
is pretty much where we wrap up today. Democrats split into three factions. Stephen A. Douglas was the popular sovereignty nominate, nominee, and he admitted that he was not a fan of the Dred Scott decision, as he had in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, because it went against the theory of popular sovereignty, making the Missouri Compromise and the Kansas-Nebraska Act unconstitutional. Southerners bolted the party, nominated John C. Breckinridge, who had been the vice presidential candidate um, under uh, Buchanan and had served as vice president, favored expansion of slavery and the annexation of Cuba, the Ostend Manifesto to annex Cuba from the 1850s that we started our lesson with today. Some Southerners formed the Constitutional Union Party. They nominated John Bell. That was mainly like Virginia, Kentucky. Remember we talked a little bit about the Nashville Convention where people went to Nashville to decide how they were gonna move forward with the um, possibility of, of the, the events of the Compromise of 1850. Nobody in here did the Nashville Convention. Did we'll talk a little bit about it later, but basically the Nashville Convention has a couple of different groups come out of it. Some of them are called fire eaters, which we talked about, that wanted secession, and others were unionists. They wanted to keep the union together, but they wanted to continue to be able to practice slavery, and they had fallen away from the Democrats. That group of people, they are going to nominate John Bell. In fact, John Bell was the only presidential candidate on the ballot in Chesterfield County in 1860. Um, and again, that was a result of the Nashville Convention that was held in the 1850s. Um, the Republicans they had name recognition, but not a lot of enemies yet. They'd only run in one major presidential election and a handful of other um, Senate elections in 1858. They nominated Lincoln on the third ballot. I had to include this, much ballyhoo in the nomination. Uh, one of my professors at BMI, Colonel Conagher, that he would always talk about much ballet who um, an excitement in the third ballot nomination. I always thought that was hilarious. So I wanted to add it as a shout out to Colonel Conagher, one of my favorite professors at BMI. Um, so there was much ballet who in this nomination because Lincoln had gained uh, some national recognition in the, um, the events that we've already talked about, the he is a as a congressman back during the Mexican War as a Whig congressman, and he is a Republican candidate um, in the election of 1858. Um, and then, obviously, some of the old Whig, the, the old concession Whigs, were falling into the Republican Party as ne uh, now. So Lincoln is not on most of the Southern state ballots, but he does manage to win the election with less than two-fifths of the popular vote. So here's a little breakdown. Lincoln wins almost 40% of the popular vote, but he overwhelmingly wins the Electoral College. So, in your opinion, why does Lincoln win this election? Good? The Electoral College swings the vote. What's another reason that Lincoln is going to be able to win this election pretty easily? He's honest. That's funny. He, that's the remarkable thing. He was not listed on a number of the ballots. Well, what's another factor here? What's another factor for Lincoln being able to win this election? Good. Excellent work. So Isaiah nailed it. It's not, it's not just two Democratic parties. It's technically three. Because the Constitutional Union Party is a bunch of old former Democrats and, old, and a handful of old Whigs. So the Democratic Party had splintered into three parts. Nice job, Isaiah. Good work. All right. So this shows you that the map, Lincoln carries the North and the West. John Bell carries Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. 
John C. Breckenridge carries the Deep South. Douglas wins Missouri. Looks like New Jersey was split too for Doug, for Lincoln and Douglas. All right, Lincoln wins the election. All right, the election concluded. Lincoln ends up winning the election by the Electoral College, but the losers refused to accept the results because Lincoln did not have a majority in the popular vote. We can trace that old tale all the way back to the election of 1824. I don't know if you remember that one, the corrupt bargain. Um, I don't need to get into that right now. Um, Lincoln didn't have a majority of the popular vote. He wasn't even on the ballot in 10 of the slave states. He was officially declared 16th President of the United States in early December of 1850. Soon after the election, the state of South Carolina will meet in the Charleston Convention, and they become known as the Charleston Bolters, because they will bolt from the Union, and they will secede from the Union on December 20th, 1860. Soon, six other states will follow South Carolina from January 1st through February 1st. And in our next lesson, I'll chronologically show you um, what states went. And those states would be Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. And then I believe, Kira, you did your research on the Montgomery Convention, right? So we'll be talking about the Montgomery Convention and the formation of the Confederate States. So we got a primary document here. This is the front page of the Charleston Mercury on December 20th. An ordinance to dissolve the union between the state of South Carolina and the United States united with her under the compact entitled the Constitution of the United States of America. The Union is dissolved. Um, but it, for the for the people that attended, not everybody attended. So, so yeah. Why would you not attend the that was Well, we'll have to look at the exact number of those that attended this particular convention, but the people that did attend the Charleston Convention, they attended to secede. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Well, and you have to keep in mind that a lot of these people have been part of previous conventions. They've been part of uh, conventions that have been held in Nashville, Memphis, New Orleans, so they were, a lot of these politicians, they were ready to go at a moment's notice. This plan had already been laid out. They were just waiting for the election results. All right, so we got the formation of the Confederate States. Southern leaders will meet in Montgomery um, to form the Confederate States and write their constitution on March 11, 1861. That was known as the Montgomery Convention. Much of the Confederate States Constitution looked exactly as the U.S. Constitution with the exception of allowing for the practice of slavery and the protection of the institution of slavery. Um, Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis was chosen as the first president of the Confederacy and they're going to put together a presidential cabinet, a legislative congress, a judiciary, the same forms of, of government that the United States government had formed. There is one significant difference for the president. He will have a six-year, one a single six-year term, but it's not going to happen. He's only going to serve four of the six. Um, well, the, he is what they would consider, they, he's not the only person that is like, whose name's in the hat, but they felt that he 
was the like he had the greatest political experience at a local state and on a national scale he had served as secretary of war um he had some really uh great military connections he was a west point graduate um and a mississippi senator so it was a reluctant choice it was sort of like a lesser of evils so to speak um his presidency is one that's really um debated because the idea is for him not to do much but in theory when he stepped in to get things done like pass a conscription act or levy taxes or inflationary tactics or whatever cabinet members would resign states would threaten to secede so he i feel like he probably did the best to govern that he could but he it, it was I think he was set up for failure from the get-go because he was trying to keep together a group of states that came together reluctantly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think that, and I, I'm getting like way ahead of myself yeah. on this, but as early as 18, as the spring of 1862, like for a full year, the war even had occurred. He was losing cabinet members and other and states were threatening to, to leave. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that as we move forward. But yeah, I think that's in the eye of the holder on whether you think he was really, really good, really bad, or you were indifferent. I think most historians would fall somewhere in the middle where he, he did well in some aspects, but he didn't do well in a lot of aspects. Um, all right. So the new rebel country would originally operate out of Montgomery, Alabama. They'll ultimately be moved to Richmond, which we'll talk about in lesson four. Confederate was established, Confederate government established. State militias were ordered to seize federal forts throughout the American South. Here we have Jeff Davis and the first national flag of the Confederate States of America, AKA the Stars and Bars. <clears throat> Questions for me? All right, so go ahead and um, get out